Welcome back to Gamma 20 in our walk through the book of Genesis, Why the Beginning Matters. This is study 21 and the last of the studies on the life of Jacob. Jacob uh, wrestles with God, Genesis 30 to 32. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, as we conclude our study of Jacob, that you will teach us how we too can wrestle with you and understand your beauty and your grace in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, let's look here. Jacob is now, the context of the passage, 31 is basically, Jake, uh, the Lord has said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and your kindred and I will be with you. So here is a command as well in the assurance that God will be with him. And Jacob starts on his journey back to the promised land. So Jacob went on his way and to encourage him, angels met him. As another, uh, not only he got, uh, sends angels in his dreams, telling him how to do the breeding program that made him successful, God actually sent angels to meet him on his way back. And Jacob was surprised and amazed and saw them and said, this is God's camp. So he, came, he called the place, name of the place Mahanaim. And here, the revelation comes with faith. He obeys. God who tells him back, he could have stayed with Laban, but he says, I'm going to go back and face the difficulties back home. So revelation comes to him with faith. He's rewarded by, uh, his faith is rewarded by revelation and God's assurance of protection because he goes back to face danger. As you remember, he has a great dispute with his brother. He had cheated Esau of his blessing. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning of my father are approaching, I will kill my brother Jacob. So it is murderous rage for which he has to face, and so therefore the presence of the angels reassures God's presence. Now, what is Jacob's plan to meet his bro uh, brother Esau? Well, here, Jacob said messages before him to Esau, to his brother in the land of Seir, the land of uh, the country of Edom, and instructing them, thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants. I have sent them sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favour in your sight. So therefore, he's very diplomatic. He sends an advance party to tell his brother that he comes in peace. Right? But here's the response. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you. Yeah, and there are 400 men with him. Uh, what would you be thinking if you were Jacob? Because this is absolutely scary, isn't it? What can we conclude? If you come at 400 men and they're probably armed, that he may make good on his previous murderous threat to the life of Jacob. So what would be Jacob's response? The old Jacob would start scheming, planning, in such a way that he would be able to trick his brother again or maybe fight him or defeat him or do something or even go back to, to Laban because of the lesser of two evils. But I want you to look at his response of a transformed Jacob. He says, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, say, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant, for which, for with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two peoples. Now let's break down this prayer and that to, to analyze how he has been transformed. First of all, there's an identification and standing with God. He now describes himself as, O oh God of my father and God of my uh, uh, father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me. So there is an identification that he is with God. Remember before at Bethel, he says, if you will bring me back, then you will be my God. Now he's already saying, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me. So he identified as part of the covenant. And this is the same assurance when we are facing danger. Paul writes, For those, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery and fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of the adoption as sons by whom you cry, we cry, Abba, Father. 
There is intimacy. We are described as sons who basically, and, and the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we identify as being precious to God as his sons, being heirs of God and as fellow heirs of Christ. And then verse 31, 32, uh, 33 says, What then shall we say to these things? Threats. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So the, the, the identification and standing that we have with God, just like Jacob, is the ground or foundation of which we will embark upon whatever he tells us to do. That's the number one thing that we know. We need to recognize that we are called to be his sons. The second thing is he recognizes God's will and plan. All right? Oh, return to your country and your kindred that I may do you good. So therefore, he's not returning to the promised land because of his own proclivities or his own desires. He actually aligns himself with God's will. And when you actually align yourself in God's will, and when you pray according to that will, you could be assured, you can be assured that, that will come to pass. That is the foundation of his, of his um, confidence. It is not the perception of his plan. Here's a prosperity gospel uh, preacher, Clifford Dollar, who actually says, when we pray, believing we have already received that what we are praying, God has no choice but to make our prayers come to pass. It is a key to getting results as a Christian. So what he has done, what has he done? He has actually weaponized faith. He has weaponized faith and made actually, uh, uh, God has no choice but to make our prayers come to pass. And actually here, God is therefore subservient to our weaponized faith. And it is not necessarily according to his plan, but according to our own desires, which is a absolute abomination of our standing to pray before God. Then there's a sense of unworthiness. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness you have shown your servant, for I with only my staff crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. So here he prays not from a sense of triumphant authority, it says, oh, I'm the believer's authority. But he comes with a sense of unworthiness because of all the good things. He crossed the river Jordan with one staff, with nothing, and now come back. I've got two huge camps. I've become so wealthy. I've become so blessed with my family. So he comes with a sense of unworthiness, not in the sense of privilege and expectation. Then he petitions, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from Esau, who I fear, for he may come and attack me. So here is a petition for deliverance. But this petition of deliverance is not a selfish petition for deliverance, but it's based on God's covenantal promises because you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea. So he's saying, Lord, please deliver me now. Deliver me from destruction of my family and my wives and my children because I believe you said you have a plan for me to make my offspring like the sand of the sea. That if, you have, if I'm, we are all killed off, we will not be able to fulfill your promises to us. So therefore, his, his petition is based on God's faithful covenantal promises, not based on our own intrinsic value, or the va but the, on the value of his promises. So again, very important when we pray, we're not praying to God telling him, look, I, I am so important that you've got to save me. But you're coming to God and asking for deliverance based on the fact that he has promised you. It's always based on what his purposes are. Right, then he expresses emotion. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, because I fear him. He may come and attack me, the mothers of my children. So here is a lament, there's, there's intimacy. He actually expresses to God, even though he trusts God, even though he trusts God, even though he's a child of God, even though he's part of the covenant, he can still fear. There is fear there, and fear is only natural, but he counters his fear by expressing it before God, and we need to learn to do this as well. And then again, lastly, is trusting God's power in His promises because God has promised us to do good, make His offspring as a sand of sea which cannot be numbered for a multitude. Now contrast him, this prayer, with his previous prayer. 
And Jacob made a vow. If God be with me and keep me in the way that I should go and give me bread to eat and the clothing to wear, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then God shall be my God. So he's saying that God, when he successfully brings me back to Canaan, to my father's house in peace, then only shall God be my God. But if you contrast him now, he has not even gone home, the prophecies have not even been fulfilled, and yet he calls this God his God. And on this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you shall give me, I will give you one tenth. So here again is a transactional phase. So this is completely different from what he was previously, isn't it? So what is Jacob's action and reaction to this impending danger for 400 men was riding steadfastly towards him? He could just have struggled with God by the river Jabok, prayer, and that would be enough. No, he didn't do that. Not only did he pray, he also divided his family, his whole group, into two camps for safety. Because if one camp is attacked, the other camp can escape. Not only that, he actually sent waves and waves of livestock and servants as a present to Esau to appease him to soften his heart that his brother loves him and gives giving him these gifts. So therefore, when we are actually confronted with problems or fear or, or danger, it is not enough just to pray and expect everything to miraculously turn. We have to do things which are in common sense here, setting his, dividing his uh, camp into two for safety's sake, and also sending presents to appease. So it actually comes together, a very practical kind of faith that he had. Now, O oh God of my Father, uh, and the basis of the, his action is faith in God's promises, because he said that God said to him, return to your country, your kindred, that I may do you good. Right? So then he comes to a situation by the Jabok River where he actually wrestles with God. It's a very famous passage. And the three things that we take from this particular passage, one, wrestling with God is a personal encounter with God. Two, breakthrough occurs when we move from trying to overcome by refusing to let go. Brokenness comes before blessing. Let's look at the first point. Wrestling is a personal encounter with God. Jacob was left alone. The man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you, unless you bless me. So here we notice that J Jacob is not wrestling with his whole family. He's wrestling alone. And, and most of us, any major crises in our life, we actually have to face alone. There's a personal calling of Jacob to, the, to, to Yahweh, and therefore he personally wrestles. And we need to, to, to meet God alone, because often in a fellowship, we may be encouraged by other people, but in the end, we actually have to have a personal faith. Now, who is he wrestling with and why does he wrestle? Well, he's actually wrestling with God. Jacob declares his God because he says, your name shall be no longer called Jacob by Israel for you have striven with God. Verse 28. If you look down in verse 30, he says, he called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. So, he, this is a very unique situation. The only time in the Bible you actually see a human being wrestle with God. And it's very, very shocking because it's like God smacking you down. We expect a God who gives us comfort and, and our faith is practiced in convenience. It's a benign God which you can manipulate. And this is a basically one-dimensional view of God. But in this view of God, uh, you know, uh, God completely defies our understanding. And, and Joni Erickson, who for since the age of 17 had actually fractured her neck and become quadriplegic, living a life of faith over the last 52 years, actually writes these words, What good is it if we only trust God when we understand His ways? That only guarantees us a life filled with doubts. So if we, if we only trust God when we understand what He's doing, then we will be filled with doubt because there are many, many times in our lives where we lose good ones, our loved ones, or, or, or lose our jobs, or have difficult illnesses, then that only guarantees us a life filled with doubt. Right? So here, you have another picture of God where God smacks you down. He's a divine intruder who comes in and disrupts your ambition, disrupts 
the tranquility of family, disrupts your job, gives you great pain and maiming. And the reason why he does that is to break your self-dependence. He wrestles all night long. Why does he wrestle all night long? Because God let him wrestle all night long so that Jacob could see how strong his own self-will really was. He's actually trying to overcome God all night long. And there are many Bible characters who have actually wrestling moments. We look at Paul, who struggled and asked God to remove the thorn from his flesh three times, and, and it wasn't successful. Jake, uh, Job, who wrestled with God because of the loss of his family and all his fortune and his health. Uh, Abraham wrestled with God, climbing up Mount Moriah to actually give up his son. Uh, here is uh, uh, Job. Wrestling produces self-discovery. He says Job had everything taken from him. His family, his wealth, his self-esteem, his clothes, his health. And he said, I heard after God has ex revealed himself to Jacob, to, to Job, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seized you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So in, and at first he sort of demanded to know why he'd be suffering, but God only ex basically showed him how great and majestic he was, and he suddenly realized, self-discovery, that he, he's actually nothing before God and there's nothing for him to demand. So wrestling produces self-discovery. And then there's a key moment. Man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. He touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. This is the key moment in the wrestling match. Andrew Bona in the Highlands of uh, Scotland described you know, the um, sheep and they can be quite uh, naughty at times. They climb to all sorts of places to, to, to eat grass. And sometimes they're stuck halfway through the cliff. And you think that the shepherd will go down immediately to go and rescue the sheep. They don't. They actually leave the sheep there for several days while they're trembling and almost fainting with exhaustion, malnutrition and dehydration. Only then will the shepherd rappel down and actually grab the sheep who will be by then quite placid and allow himself to be lifted up to safety. If they were to intervene immediately, the sheep would panic and he would jump over the cliff and then cause him to die. And that's the same thing with us, isn't it? Transformation is by pain. We start off with fighting God, opposing His will, insisting on our own desires, our own goals, and our own blessings. That's the wrestling process. And you, and you find out at the end of the wrestling process, our only desire is to hang on to God because we are acquiesce to His will. Now, therefore, instead of our will, we're actually insisting on His blessing. And this is not a cognitive process. This is actually an experiential process where we're actually fighting God to hanging on to God. You see, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You're going to come to a stage where I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it's the same as Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the heart, your heart's desires. Our problem in this spiritual transformation process is our struggle is the pursuit of our own heart's desires outside His will. That's the struggle. The struggle is to realize that actually the, the, the key to our desires is actually to be delighting in God. He has transformed us so that our, our greatest desires are achieved only by loving God. Charles Finney writes about spiritual breakthrough. In this wrestling situation in our own lives, where we all struggle with God when we are down, we struggle for this breakthrough, and breakthrough comes when God becomes the center of our affection and not a means to an end. When we desire to commune with Him, to have eternal union with Him, when we're satisfied with Him, where we have confidence in Him, where we have glad submission, and deep interest in His glory and His honour rather than our own petty ambitions. Contrast this with false teachers like Kenneth Copeland, who basically trusting the power of faith to gain the desires of our heart. He says, faith is a spiritual force, a spiritual energy, a spiritual power. It is this force of faith that makes the laws of the spirit world function. So what he's doing is that he's using faith as a spiritual key. 
to unlock the powers of the world of universe. The focus is on our faith, not his promises. There are certain laws governing prosperity revealed in God's word. Faith causes them to function. So now he's actually bypassing God. He's just using faith to unlock these laws that causes our to, to us to get all the desires of our heart. This completely bypasses God. God becomes a means to our end. All right? And, and it's no different from Star Wars, a pantheistic concept that, that, that God is like a force to be with you. All you have to do is learn to concentrate, to submit to the force, to use the force for your own means. John Piper writes, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. So we will have that joy. We will have that joy which is our desire if we actually see the beauty of Christ in the Word. And, and 2 Corinthians 3.18 actually describes this. We with all unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So how are we going to be transformed? We're being transformed when we behold the glory of God. But the trouble is, we won't look until we are broken. Absolutely broken. Jacob winds up at the end of the wrestling episode, broken but blessed. Broken because he's totally dependent on God, which represents his dependence. Every time he walks with a limb, that limb makes him dependent, but totally transformed because his name will be changed into Israel, where God fights, where he's, God strives for him, basically. The problem with us is our theology, the wrong theology. We have theology of glory. We want a healing now, victory now, power now, change now. And if we don't get this, in some churches, they will teach you this. You could exercise the power of faith to get all this, and if you don't get this, then you become broken, but not only broken, but bitter. Because you will promise all these things now, and if you don't get them, you will become broken, but bitter. Here's um, Joni Erickson. After struggling for a long time with God, because she couldn't accept at 17 years of age, with the whole life ahead of her, that she was permanently quadriplegic from the neck down. And he says, after struggling with God, says, Oh God, I can't live this way. Please, if I am not going to die, show me how to live. So after a moment of epiphany, instead of struggling, God telling her, I can't live like this. Now, if I'm not going to die, please tell me how to live. And this is a turning point in her life. After struggling with God, he, you know, she describes that I am not, if I'm not going to die, show me how to live, right? And uh, contrary to all the beliefs about quadriplegia, if you're quadriplegic, you no point living, there's no quality of life, she actually discovers this. And if God's glory shines brightness through our weakness, which it does, then our inabilities become the best platform for God's highest glory that makes for the greatest quality of life. We always say, you know, you have to be hooked to a respirator or, you, or, or, or you, you have everybody come and help you. You're paralyzed with neck down. You can't even wipe your own backside. That is no way to live, all right? What she is saying that God's glory shines brightest through our weakness, right? So our inabilities therefore become the best platform for God's highest glory. And that, to glorify God, is the greatest quality of life. Right, so which is quite mind-turning, isn't it, for us in our concepts. So our strength lies in our tenacity, in hanging on and depending on Him. We do not fight to overcome circumstances or enemies, but we fight to hold on to our faith. You see, we always fight and, and struggle because we want to overcome the difficult circumstances of life, but you don't really understand that the real fight is how we hold on to our faith in Him. Uh, here is uh, John Ottberg, who wrote the book, The Me I Want to Be. says, Jesus doesn't come to rearrange the outside of our lives the way we want it. He comes to rearrange the inside of our life the way God wants it. And this rearrangement is difficult and painful, and therefore brokenness comes before blessing. And each one has gone through it. Paul, broken before uh, on his trip to Damascus. When God caused him to be blind, Joseph thrust into the depths of a uh, dungeon, in a hole, 
as, as well as in the dungeons in Egypt. Moses in the backside of the desert for 40 years. Brokenness comes before blessing. Stephen Cole of Flagstaff Christian Fellowship writes these words, Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed in a sense of hanging on until God blessed him. But first, God prevailed over Jacob by crippling his stubborn self-dependence. Jacob's prevailing with men is a prediction of how God will now conquer Jacob's enemies, the most pressing being Esau, by his power rather than through Jacob's conniving ways. Right? So there's self-discovery before a name change. So here we actually have in verse 27, he said to him, What is your name? Why would God ask Jacob his name? Doesn't God know Jacob's name? Well, and he said Jacob. You know what Jacob means? Jacob means supplanter, corn man. And so here for God forces Jacob into self-discovery. What is your name? Well, I'm a corn man. I'm Jacob. And then he says to Jacob, Then your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but it will be Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. So there's a name change from a corn man, supplanter, into Israel. Israel means he who strives with God or God strives for him. All right, there's an absolute change. The change in name represents a change in his character. It's a win-win situation. Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed in the sense of hanging on until God blessed him. God prevailed in the wrestling match over Jacob by crippling his stubborn self-dependence. He got him to where he needed him to be. All right, and that's the same kind of qualities that Jesus brought at the Sermon on the Mount. When we wrestle with God, we don't want to wind up in the end when God prevails in our lives, that we are poor in spirit, totally dependent on Him. We mourn our sinfulness. We're meek. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're merciful. We're pure in heart. We're peacemakers and we are persecuted. That is what it means to be asking for God's blessing, hanging on to who God is. The transformation is complete. Here you've got a fear of God and, uh, and reconciliation. Jacob says, no, please, I have found, if I, he's confronting Esau, right? No, please, if I found favor in your sight, then accept my presence from my hand. I've seen your face, which is like the seeing the face of God, and you've, you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing, which is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, and he urged him, and he took it. So here he's facing Esau. This is the final moment of reconciliation. They have accepted each other. And the basis of why Jacob can do that is because God has dealt graciously with me and because I've had enough. He's so filled with God that he doesn't need anything else, that he can actually have no grudges and actually reconcile with his brother. Now the rest of the story, all right, he is Genesis 33, reconciliation. Genesis 34, the rape of Dinah, the daughter, and the, and the sons actually massacred the men of Shechem while they were uh, being circumcised. And, and then he basically uh, forced Jacob to leave this land which he had bought there. And then Genesis 35, there's an altar back at Bethel. The covenant is renewed. Birth of Je Benjamin, death of Rebekah and Isaac, and, and then the terrible situation where Reuben has had sex with Bilal. And Genesis 36 is a genealogy Esau and the Edomite. So this is basically, we're not going to be really dealing with this. But the point is, the story unfolds and tells us that even though he's transformed, even though he has a new name called Israel does not shield Jacob from the, all the obstacles and tragedies of his life. He, his daughter is raped. His, his sons, you know, cause a massacre at Shechem. He has to move out from the land which he bought. All right? He loses his favorite son, Joseph, and doesn't see him till years later on. But see the way he responds. He responds with the fear of God a transformed life. He doesn't use conniving ways anymore. He's a God-fearing man, with a, which means he, a healthy fear in him that constrains him to do right and restrains him from doing wrong. And the ending of his life, towards the end, is back at the place where he began, Bethel, the house of God, where he actually met God. Let me conclude with Joni Erickson. 52 years later on, She's confined to the wheelchair for 52 years, and the last 10 of which she started to develop chronic pain, which is 
pain every single day. In 2010, she developed breast cancer on top of the quadriplegia, had surgery for that, had chemotherapy for that. In 2017-18, she had a recurrence of the breast cancer, had to have surgery again and chemotherapy again. You had thought that this person being transformed by God, having gone through the most terrible things in her life, would be at least be given a break. She got pain over pain over pain. Does she deserve this? Well, you ask her. They asked her that, what if the accident never happened? You know what she said? She said, I'd have drifted through life. I'd be married. I'd be probably divorced like my classmates. I'd be disillusioned and dissatisfied with life. I've always acted self selfishly in, church, in school and it probably wouldn't have been any different. And I never built my life on any long lasting value if the accident didn't happen. Then are you happy? And she says at 70 years of age, I wouldn't change my life for anything. I'm really thankful he did something to get my attention and change me. So Joni Erickson is placing her value, her desires in life, not upon the external circumstances, but actually recasting those external circumstances into what she sees as value, the spiritual transformation in her life. She's saying, I want to hold on to you. So let me conclude the most important take-home lesson that we have in the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and going into Joseph is the covenant. The covenant is God's saving action through Scripture defined to us that the most important thing that holds us this day is God's promises to be with us. And this is the hope for our tomorrow. And when we study Genesis and see His love, and his faithful love, uh, faithfulness dramatically illustrated in the lives of all these patriarchs. It gives us strength for the future. We are children of the covenant. We are children of faith. And we need to trust God that he holds us by the strength of his word. May God add a blessing to his word.